What were the intolerable acts? The so-called intolerable acts, also known as the coercive acts, were five laws passed by the British Parliament early in 1774, intended to assert British authority in the Massachusetts colony. The measures were seen as punishment for the Boston Tea Party, December 1773. In brief, the laws enacted the following, closure of the port of Boston. An English trial for any British officer or soldier who was charged with murder in the colonies. The change of the Charter of Massachusetts such that the council had to be appointed by the British and that town meetings could not be held without the British appointed, governor's permission, the requirement that the colonists house and feed British soldiers and the extension of the province of Quebec southward to the Ohio River. While the British intention was to bring the Massachusetts colony under control, and actually the Fifth Act was not intended to have any punitive effect on the colony. The result was instead to unite all the colonies in opposition to British rule. In this regard, the acts are seen as a precursor to the American Revolution, 1775-83. Why is Da Vinci called the Universal Man? Leonardo da Vinci, 1452-1519, possessed an intensely curious mind and an inventive imagination. He is known by students both for his famous works of art including The Last Supper. 1495-98, and Mona Lisa, 1503-05, as well as for his scientific notes and drawings dealing with matters of botany. Anatomy, Zoology, Hydraulics, and Physiology. By his own claim, he pursued scientific investigations only to make himself a better painter. Nevertheless, he clearly endeavored to understand the laws of nature. Consequently, he made a study of man, contributing to the understanding of physiology and psychology. Leonardo da Vinci's body of work provided the foundation of high renaissance sculpture. Painting, drawing, and architecture. As an artist genius, da Vinci earned the epithet Universal Man. And has become a wonder of the modern world, for, as Gardner's art through the ages put it, having stood at the beginning of a new epoch like a prophet and a sage. When did the American suffragist movement begin? In the 1840s American women began organizing and, in increasing numbers, demanding the right to vote. The movement was started by women who sought social reforms, including outlawing slavery, instituting a national policy of temperance, abstinence from alcoholic beverages, and securing better work opportunities and pay. These reformers soon realized that in order to make change they needed the power of the vote. Among the leaders of the suffragist movement was feminist and reformer Elizabeth Cady Stanton, 1815-1902. to 
she joined with anti-slavery activist Lucretia Mott, 1793-1880, to organize the first women's rights convention in 1848 in Seneca Falls, New York, launching the woman suffragist movement. In 1869 Stanton teamed with Susan B. Anthony, 1820-1906, to organize the National Woman Suffrage Association. That same year, another group was formed, the American Woman Suffrage Association. Led by women's rights and anti-slavery activist Lucy Stone, 1818-1893, and her husband Henry Brown Blackwell, 1825 to 1909. In 1870 the common cause of the two groups was strengthened by the passage of the 15th Amendment, which gave all men, regardless of race, the right to vote. When the two organizations joined forces in 1890, they formed the National American Woman Suffrage Association, NASA. The founders of the American women's movement were followed by a new generation of leaders, which included Stanton's daughter, Harriet Eaton Blatch, 1856-1940, as well as Alice Paul, 1885-1977. Who founded the organization that became the National Woman's Party? An organizer and editor Lucy Burns, 1879 to 1966, who worked closely with Paul. The suffragists appealed to middle class and working class women, as well as to students and radicals. They waged campaigns at the state level, distributed literature organized meetings, made speeches, and marched in parades. They also lobbied federal legislators, picketed, and chained themselves to the White House fence. When jailed, many resorted to hunger strikes and were sometimes met with cruel treatment. The suffragists' fight was a fierce one, the opposition played on the widespread belief that if given the right to vote, women would neglect the traditional duties of wife and mother. The movement gained strength during World War I, 1914-18. As men went off to fight the war in Europe, the women at home demonstrated themselves to be intelligent and involved citizens in the life of the country. A wartime suffragist poster declared in one long column, as a war measure. The country is asking of women's service as, farmers, mechanics, nurses, doctors, munitions workers, mine workers, yeomen. Gas makers, bellboys, messengers, conductors, motormen, army cooks, telegraphers, ambulance drivers. Advisors to the Council of National Defense, and in another short column it stated, as a war measure. Women are asking of the country, the vote. By 1918 support for woman suffrage was broad. That year Congress proposed a constitutional amendment stating that the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. It was passed, as the proposed 19th Amendment. In the House in 1918 and in the Senate in 1919. The amendment was approved by the required. Number of state legislatures on August 18, 1920, when Tennessee ratified it. What was the League of Nations?
the League of Nations was the forerunner to the United Nations. It was an international organization established by the Treaty of Versailles at the end of World War I, 1914 to 18. Since the United States never ratified that treaty, it was not a member. The League was set up to handle disputes among countries and to avoid another major conflict such as the Great War. Which is how World War I was referred to until the outbreak of World War II. But the organization proved to be ineffective, it was unable to intervene in such acts of aggression as Japan's invasion of Manchuria in 1931, Italy's conquest of Ethiopia. During 1935 to 1936 and occupation of Albania in 1939, and Germany's takeover of Austria in 1938. The League of Nations dissolved itself during World War II, 1939 to 45. Though unsuccessful, the organization did establish a basic model for a permanent international organization. How did the Aztec and Inca empires compare with the Mayan? while all were advanced civilizations that were eventually conquered by Spaniards. The Inca and Aztec cultures reached their peaks in the 15th century just before the arrival of the Europeans in the New World. The Mayan civilization reached its zenith about 500 years earlier, and was already in decline by the time of European incursion. Each group also occupied a different region of the Americas, where each carved out its own stronghold and flourished, the Aztecs settled in central Mexico, the Incas in western South America, primarily Peru, and the Mayas in the Yucatan Peninsula and Central America. There is evidence that they traded with each other as well as with American Indians to the north. The Aztecs founded their central city of Tenochtitlan, the site of Mexico City. About 1325. A poor nomadic people before their arrival in Mexico's central region. The Aztecs believed the Lake Texcoco Marsh was a prophetic place to settle. Before they built it into a great city, they first had to fill in the swampy area which they did by creating artificial islands. In the 1500s, when the Spanish first saw the remarkable city with its system of causeways, canals, bridges, and aqueducts they called it the Venice of the New World. In addition to constructing the impressive trade and cultural center of Tenochtitlan, the Aztecs were farmers. Astronomers, mathematicians, and historians who recorded the events of their civilization. Their religion was pantheistic, meaning they worshipped many gods. Given that, it's not surprising that when the Spanish conquistadors arrived, at first the Maya believed they were gods, or at least, the heavenly hosts of their long-awaited god Quetzalcoatl, and even welcomed them with gifts. Later, the Aztec rose up against the Europeans, but under the leadership of Hernán Cortés. 1485-1547, the Spaniards conquered the group. Claiming Mexico in August 1521. The Incas developed one of the most extensive empires in all the Americas. 
during the hundred years before the arrival of the Europeans. The Incas expanded their territory along the western coast of South America to include parts of present-day Peru. Ecuador, Colombia, Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. Though it was a vast region, it was nevertheless a closely knit state ruled by a powerful emperor. The government was subdivided down to the local level. But because the emperor required total obedience from his subjects, local rulers were kept in check. Like the Aztecs in Mexico, the Inca developed an infrastructure that included a network of roads, bridges, and ferries as well as irrigation systems. They too, built impressive edifices, demonstrating their abilities as engineers. The magnificent city of Machu Picchu was modeled in clay before construction began. The Inca were also skilled craftspeople, working with gold, silver, and textiles. Like the Aztecs, the Incas worshipped many gods. And when the Spanish explorer Francisco Pizarro, c. 1475-1541, arrived in the region in 1532, he was welcomed as a god at first. However, by 1537 the Inca were brought under Spanish control. What is the history of the Dow Jones Industrial Average? A measure of stock prices of important industrial companies, the Dow Jones Industrial Average DJIA, was first printed in the Wall Street Journal in 1897. The average is an indicator of the market overall and is used, along with other indexes, by investors, stockbrokers, and analysts to make investment forecasts and decisions. The Dow, as it has come to be called, was conceived of as a summary measure of the stock market. An index that could be used to analyze past trends, indicate current trends, and even predict future ones. The first DJIA averaged the prices of 12 major companies. The list had been expanded since, in 1916 it averaged the stock prices of 20 companies. In 1928, 30. Adjustments have been made as the result of company mergers and dissolutions. Though it is a measure only of the New York Stock Exchange. The Dow Jones average has been called a barometer of the stock market. News of fluctuations in the DJIA can affect market prices around the world. How did modern dance begin? American dancer and choreographer Martha Graham, 1894-1991, is the acknowledged creator of modern dance. She was 35 years old when the Martha Graham Dance Group made its debut on April 14, 1929. Ushering in a new era in dance performance. The new form of dance dissolved the separation between mind and body and relied on technique that was built from within. Graham's interest in dance had begun in her youth. And as an astute observer and manipulator of light and space, she came to be regarded later in life as one of the 
Masters of the Modernist Movement on a PAR with artist Pablo Picasso, 1881-1973. She is credited with revolutionizing dance as an art form. In her hands it had become nonlinear and non-representational theater. Choreographing some 180 works in her lifetime, she also taught many students who rose to prominence as accomplished and masterful dancers, including Merce Cunningham and Paul Taylor. What happened to the Hindenburg? The image of the large airship bursting into flames is familiar to many, Hindenburg. A German vessel and the largest airship ever built, exploded while it was trying to land at Lakehurst, New Jersey, at about 7.25 p. m. On May 6, 1937, Hindenburg had just completed a transatlantic flight and had dropped its Mooring lines to the ground crew when the hydrogen gas that kept the airship afloat caught fire. Within 32 seconds, Hindenburg was nothing but smoldering rubble on the ground. 62 of the 97 people on board survived the crash. In addition to the 35 passengers and crew who lost their lives. One member of the American ground crew also perished. Though the cause of the fire has never been conclusively determined. It is believed that an atmospheric electrical spark not sabotage ignited hydrogen gas that was flowing from a leak. The fact that the outer cover of the tail section had been observed to flutter just seconds. Before the explosion lends credence to the explanation that there had been a gas leak. The crash was thoroughly documented. Though travel by airship had been going on for more than 25 years and some. 50,000 passengers had been transported without a single fatality. The Hindenburg's landing in New Jersey was still an event for which many spectators turned out. Airships were a marvel of technology. And the Hindenburg in particular was worth seeing since it was the largest afloat. Even though the airship was more than 12 hours behind schedule. Due to weather over the Atlantic, the arrival was eagerly anticipated. The entire event was caught on film, and that documentary was widely shown in movie news reels. Newspaper and radio coverage also helped link the Hindenburg and airship travel on the whole with terrifying technological disaster. The highly publicized crash effectively ended airship travel. A sister ship, the Graf Zeppelin, was en route from Rio de Janeiro back home to Germany when news of the Hindenburg disaster came in. Upon arrival, the Graf Zeppelin was grounded until the cause of the Hindenburg's crash was known. No passenger airships took flight again. Two years later, an airplane carried its first paying passenger across the Atlantic. Today, airships, or blimps, are used by major corporations such as Goodyear during national events. Primarily sporting events. Some airships are also used for reconnaissance and patrol. How did America get its name?
America is derived from the name of Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci, 1454-1512, who took part in several early voyages to the New World. Vespucci had been a merchant in service of the Medici family in Florence, and later moved to Spain where he worked for the company that outfitted the ships for Christopher Columbus's, 1451 to 1506, second and third voyages. He sailed with the Spaniards on several expeditions, in 1497, 1499, 1501, and 1503. Though scholars today question his role as an explorer, in a work by German geographer Martin Wald Seemuller. C1470 C1520, published in 1507, the author credited Vespucci with realizing that he had actually arrived in a new world not in the Far East as other explorers, including Columbus, had believed. Thus, Wald Seemuller suggested the new lands be named America after Amerigo Vespucci. For his part, Wald Seemuller was led to believe this by Vespucci himself who had written to Lorenzo de Medici in 1502 or 1503, relaying his discovery of a new continent and vividly describing it. About a year later, the letter was published under the title Mundus Novus. New World, which was translated and published in future editions. The designation America was used again in 1538 by Flemish cartographer Gerardus Mercator. Gerhard Kremer, 1512-1594 Today the term in the singular refers to either continent in the Western Hemisphere and sometimes specifically to the United States. In the plural, it refers to all of the lands of the Western Hemisphere, including North and South America and the West Indies. Who was Rosie the Riveter? The term referred to the American women who worked factory jobs as part of the war effort on the home front. Where auto plants and other industrial facilities were converted into defense plants to manufacture airplanes, ships, and weapons. As World War II, 1939-45, wore on, more and more men went overseas to fight, resulting in a shortage of civilian male workers. And so, women pitched in. However, at the end of the war, Many of these women were displaced as the men returned home to their jobs and civilian life. Nevertheless, the contribution of all the Rosie the Riveters was instrumental to the war effort. What did Shakespeare study? It is thought that William Shakespeare, 1564-1616, attended the King's New School. The local grammar school in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, where the main course of instruction was in Latin. There, students were taught rhetoric, logic, and ethics. And studied works by classical authors Terence, Plautus, Cicero, Virgil, Plutarch, Horace, and Ovid. 
it is believed that this was the extent of Shakespeare's education. There is no evidence that he attended a university. What is no drama? It is the oldest form of traditional Japanese drama, dating to a D1383. It is rooted in the principles of Zen Buddhism, a religion emphasizing meditation, discipline, and the transition of truth from master to disciple. History and legend are the subjects of no plays, which are traditionally performed on a bear. Wooden stage by masked male actors who performed the story using highly controlled movements. The drama is accompanied by a chorus, which chants lines from the play. The art form was pioneered by actor dramatist Moto Kiyozimi, 1363 to 1443, when he was 20 years old. Zimi had begun acting at age seven and went on to write more than half of the roughly 250 no dramas that are still performed today. Which artists and thinkers are considered the greatest minds of the Renaissance? The great writers of the Renaissance include the Italian poet Petrarch, 1304-1374, who became the first great writer of the Renaissance and was one of the first proponents of the concept that a rebirth was in progress. Florentine historian Niccolo Machiavelli, 1469-1527, who wrote the highly influential work The Prince. 1513, English dramatist and poet William Shakespeare, 1564-1616. Whose works many view as the culmination of Renaissance writing, Spain's Miguel de Cervantes, 1547-1616, who penned Don Quixote. 1605, the epic masterpiece that gave birth to the modern novel, and Frenchman François Rabelais, c. 1483-1553, who is best known for writing the five-volume novel Gargantua and Pantagruel. The great artists of the Renaissance include the Italian painter-slash-sculptor Sandro Botticelli, 1445-1510. Whose works include The Birth of Venus, Leonardo da Vinci, 1452 to 1519. Whose Mona Lisa and The Last Supper are among the most widely studied works of art, Michelangelo Bonarotti, 1475 to 1564. Whose sculpture David became the symbol of the New Florence, and Raphael Sanzio, 1483 to 1520. Whose school of Athens is considered by art historians to be the complete statement of the High Renaissance? Did the Wright brothers invent the airplane? The Wright brothers were the first to successfully build and fly an airplane. And both events went virtually unnoticed at the time. The owners of a bicycle shop in their hometown of Dayton, Ohio, Wilbur. 1867-1912, and Orville, 1871-1948, Wright were interested in mechanics from early ages. 
After attending high school, the brothers went into business together and interested in aviation, began tinkering with gliders in their spare time. The brothers consulted national weather reports to determine the most advantageous spot for conducting flying experiments. Based on this data, they concluded it was Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. There in 1900 and 1901, on a narrow strip of sand called Kill Devil Hills. They tested their first gliders that could carry a person. Back at their bicycle shop in Ohio, they constructed a small wind tunnel, about six feet in length, in which they ran experiments using wing models to determine air pressure. As a result of this research, the Wright brothers were the first to write accurate tables of air pressures on curved surfaces. Based on their successful glider flights and armed with their new knowledge of air pressure, Orville and Wilbur Wright designed and built an airplane. The return to Kitty Hawk in September 1903 to try the craft but weather prevented them from doing so until December. It was days before Christmas when, on December 17, 1903, the Wright brothers made the world's first flight in a power-driven, heavier-than-air machine. Orville piloted the craft a distance of 120 feet and stayed in the air 12 seconds. They made a total of four flights that day, and Wilbur made the longest. 59 seconds of flight time that cover just more than 850 feet. It was not a news event, the brothers had witnesses, a few spectators on the beach in North Carolina. And there were a handful of newspaper accounts of the Wrights' marvelous feat, but some were inaccurate. After they made a public announcement in January 1904, Popular Science Monthly published a report. In March, as did another magazine. Other than these scant notices, the Wrights received no attention for their accomplishments. Many were trying to do what the Wrights had done. But the public was skeptical that any heavier than air man made machine could take flight. The doubt played a role in the lack of acclaim. Meanwhile, the brothers continued their experiments at a field near Dayton. In 1904 and 1905, they made 105 flights, but totaled only 45 minutes in the air. The Wright brothers persisted, and in spite of public skepticism, which initially included that of the U.S. government. In 1908 Orville and Wilbur Wright signed a contract with the Department of War to build the first military airplane. Only then did they receive the media attention they deserved. A year later, they set up the American Wright Company to manufacture airplanes. In spring 1912 Wilbur became sick and died. Three years later Orville sold his share in the company and retired. The plane piloted by the two brothers in December 1903 near Kitty Hawk is on display at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Who wrote the U.S. Constitution? In spirit the U. 
S. Constitution was created by all of the 55 delegates to the meeting that convened on May 25, 1787. In Philadelphia's Independence Hall Thomas Jefferson, 1743-1826, called the Constitutional Convention an assembly of demigods. And with good cause, the delegates were the young nation's brightest and best. When the states had been called upon to send representatives to the meeting, 12 states answered by sending their most experienced, most talented, and smartest men, Rhode Island, which feared the interference of a strengthened national government in state affairs, sent no one to Philadelphia. Even in such stellar company, the document did have to be written. While many had a hand in this process, it was New York lawyer and future American. Politician and diplomat Governor Morris, 1752-1816, who actually took on the task of penning the Constitution. Putting into prose the resolutions reached by the Convention. Morris had the considerable help of the records that James Madison, 1751-1836, of Virginia had kept as he managed the debates among the delegates and suggested compromises. In that capacity and in that he designed the system of checks and balances among the legislative. Congress, the Executive, the President of the United States and the judicial, Supreme Court, Madison had considerable influence on the document's language. Quite rightfully earning him the designation father of the Constitution. The original document, drafted by Morris, is preserved in the National Archives building in Washington. D.C. While the Constitution has been amended by Congress, the tenets set forth therein have remained with Americans for more than two centuries, and they have provided proof to the countries of the world that a constitution outlining the principles and purposes of its government is necessary to good government. Why is the Ballet's Russes famous? The notoriety of the Ballet's Russes began on a May night in 1909. It was then that the company, created by Russian impresario Sergei Dyagulov, 1872-1929, performed innovative ballet choreographed by Michel Fokin, 1880-1942. The Parisian audience, made up of the city's elite, was wowed by the choreography, set design, and musical scores. As well as the performances of the lead dancers the athletic vigor of Václav Nijinsky. The delicate beauty of Tamara Karsavina, the expressiveness of Anna Pavlova, and the exotic quality of Ida Rubinstein. Ballet had been freed of the constraints and conventions that had held it captive. The art form was reawakened. The reforms were on every level, choreography, performance, costuming, and design. The company's chief set designer was Leon Baxt, 1866-1924, whose sense of color had influenced not only stage designs but even women's fashions. Soon Dyagulov and the ballet's Russes were at the center of the art world. Major 20th century painters, including Robert Edmund Jones, Pablo Picasso, Andre de Rain 
Henry Matisse, and Joan Miro, created set and costume designs for the dance company. And Dyagulov commissioned music that could match the spectacular dancing. Choreography, and decor of his ballets. History's most celebrated composers, including Maurice Ravel, Claude Debussy, Richard Strauss. Sergei Prokofiev, and Igor Stravinsky, provided the scores for the dances performed by Ballet's Russes. The company, under Dyagulov's direction, had created a completely different kind of dance drama. Bringing ballet out of the shadows of opera and asserting it as an art form unto itself. The ballet companies of today are the lasting legacy of the ballet's Russes. Dyagulov illustrated that through a collaborative process. Excellent art could be created outside the traditional academy. The ballet's Russes provided 20th century dance with the model of the touring ballet company and seasonal repertory. What was the charge up San Juan Hill? On July 1, 1898, during the Spanish-American War, Colonel Theodore Roosevelt 1858-1919, led his American troops, known as the Rough Riders, on an attack of the Spanish blockhouse, a small fort, on San Juan Hill, near Santiago, Cuba. Newspaper reports made Roosevelt and the Rough Riders into celebrities. And even after he became a U.S. president, Teddy Roosevelt remarked that San Juan was the great day of my life. San Juan Hill was part of a two-pronged assault on Santiago. While the Rough Riders regiment attacked the Spanish defenses at San Juan and Kettle Hills. Another American division, led by General Henry Lawton, 1843 to 1899, captured the Spanish fort at El Cani. The success of the two initiatives on July 1st combined to give the Americans command over the ridges surrounding Santiago. By July 3rd, the American forces had destroyed the Spanish fleet. Under the command of Admiral Pascual Cervera White Apete, 1839-1909. On July 17 the Spanish surrendered the city. Though the victory was critical to the outcome of the war. The assault on Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill had come at a high price, 1,600 American lives were lost. In a battle that had seen American troops black and white fight the Spanish shoulder to shoulder. What is karma? Karma is a belief shared by several Asian religions including Buddhism and Hinduism. The basic concept is that the position one holds in this life is a result of one's actions and conduct in previous lives or incarnations. Therefore, actions and thoughts in this life can influence one's future destiny. The goal of many Eastern religions is to be freed from the cycle of karma by following certain religious practices. The word originates from the Sanskrit karma, meaning work or fate.
Why is Rembrandt considered the archetype of the modern artist? To understand the similarities between Rembrandt van Rijn, 1606-1669, and the modern artist. It's important to note that this master portrait painter, who broke ground in his use of light and shadow, was in his own time criticized for his work, some thought it too personal or too eccentric. An Italian biographer asserted that Rembrandt's works were concerned with the ugly. And he described the artist as a tasteless painter. Rembrandt's subjects included lower class people, the events of everyday life and everyday business. As well as the humanity and humility of Christ, rather than the choirs, trumpets and celestial triumph that were the subjects of other religious paintings at the time. His portraits reveal his interest in the effects of time on human features including his own. In summary, the Dutch artist approached his work with psychological insight and profound sympathy for the human affliction. He was also known to use the butt end of his brush to apply paint. Thus, he strayed outside the accepted limits of great art at the time. Art critics today recognize Rembrandt as not only one of the great portrait painters, but a master of realism. The Dutch painter, who also etched, drew, and made prints, is regarded as an example for the working artist. He showed that the subject is less important than what the artist does with his materials. Among his most acclaimed works are the Syndics of the Cloth Guild, 1662, and The Return of the Prodigal Son. C. 1665 the first painting shows a board of directors going over the books. And Rembrandt astutely captures the moment when the six businessmen are interrupted, thus showing a remarkably real everyday scene. The Return of the Prodigal Son is one of the most moving religious paintings of all time. Here Rembrandt has with great compassion rendered the reunion of father and son. Capturing that moment of mercy when the contrite son kneels before his forgiving father. Through his series of self-portraits, Rembrandt documented his own history from the confidence and optimism of his youth to the worn resignation of his declining years. What was the Trail of Tears? The Trail of Tears was the government-enforced Western migration of the American Indians, which began March 25, 1838, as an increasing number of white settlers moved inland from the coastal areas. They laid claim to Indian homelands, conflicts ensued. The government's solution was to relocate the Indians to make room for the pioneers. As many as 17,000 members of the Cherokee Nation were forced from tribal lands in Georgia, Alabama, and Tennessee, and were escorted west by federal troops under the command of General Winfield Scott. 1786 to 1866, along an 800-mile trail that followed the Tennessee, Ohio, Mississippi, and Arkansas rivers to Indian Territory in Oklahoma, north of the Red River. The journey took between 93 and 139 days, 
and the movement westward was called the Trail of Tears Knot. Only because it was a journey the native people did not wish to make, to a place where they did not wish to go. But because an estimated 4,000 people mostly infants, children, and the elderly died en route. The deaths were caused by sickness, including measles, whooping cough, pneumonia, and tuberculosis. Escorted in waves, it was a full year, spring of 1839, before the Cherokee had been relocated. Some 1,000 had refused to leave their tribal lands in the southeast. The forced migration thus resulted in the fragmentation and weakening of the tribe. What was the impact of the Hundred Years' War? After waging war with each other for more than a century. In 1453, both England and France emerged as stronger, centralized governments. As the governments had gained strength, the nobility in both countries found themselves with less power and influence than they had enjoyed previously, and the system of feudalism, which before the war had been necessary in the absence of a larger, protective entity, was on the decline. In their strategies against each other, both countries had developed new military tactics. And though England had fewer resources than did France, it still managed to assert itself at sea, marking the beginning of that country's naval prowess. How did World War I end? Though the United States had been little prepared to enter the war, the American government mobilized quickly to rally the troops and the citizens behind the war effort. In April 1917, the U.S. Regular Army was comprised of just more than 100,000 men by the end of the war. The American armed forces stood some 5 million strong. It was the arrival of the U.S. troops that gave the Allies the manpower they needed to win the war. After continued fighting in the trenches of Europe, which had left almost 10 million dead. In November 1918, Germany agreed to an armistice and the Central Powers finally surrendered. In January 1919 Allied representatives gathered in Paris to draw up the peace settlement. What was Black Hawk Down? Though the U. S. military uses the term to communicate any crash of one of its Black Hawk helicopters. The phrase is closely associated with events in Mogadishu, Somalia, on October 3, 1993. The term became synonymous. With that day after American journalist Mark Bowden wrote a book, by the same title. Describing a disastrous U.S. raid on a Mogadishu warlord. The book was turned into a movie in 2001. The background is this. Somalia threw off its colonial constraints in 1960 to become an independent nation. 
but warring factions within the impoverished East African nation made a stable central government elusive. After staging a 1969 coup, Soviet-influenced army commander Mohamed Syed Bar. 1919 or 1921 to 1995, established a military dictatorship in Somalia. His authoritarian rule, which was marked by human rights abuses, lasted until 1991 when he was deposed in a popular uprising, he died in exile four years later. The nation of about 8 million people was in chaos, and many were starving. International donations of food were hijacked and used by competing warlords to secure weapons from other nations, thus furthering civil strife. After a 1992 ceasefire, the United Nations sent peacekeepers to Somalia and launched a humanitarian relief operation. Outgoing U.S. President George H.W. Bush, 1924 supported the UN effort by approving a deployment of 25.000 American troops to Somalia to help secure trade routes over which badly needed food supplies could move. In 1993 the United States, then led by President Bill Clinton, 1946, reduced the number of troops to less than half the original deployment. Trouble was ignited on June 5, 1993, when 24 Pakistani soldiers in Somalia as part of the UN operation, were killed in an ambush. The warlord thought to be responsible for the massacre was Mohammed Farahated. Somalia's government ordered Aided's arrest. His capture was an imperative to peace. He and his followers were staging a violent rebellion against the provisional Somali government. Led by aided rival Ali Mahdi. Over the next several months, UN and US forces launched several attacks on what were believed to be aided clan strongholds, but aided himself remained an elusive target. On October 3rd US Elite forces launched an assault on a Mogadishu hotel believed to be an aided hideout. They were met with an ambush. Over the following 17 hours, U.S. troops, including a military mission to rescue downed Black Hawk helicopter crews, engaged in a battle with armed Somalis in the streets of Mogadishu. 18 American servicemen were killed, the bodies of some were dragged through the streets of the city. Another 84 American soldiers were wounded. Hundreds of Somalis were killed in the fighting. Video footage of the chaos was shown on international television. The Battle of Mogadishu, as it is officially called was the most intense combat firefight experienced by U.S. troops since Vietnam. On October 7, President Clinton signed orders to withdraw all American troops from Somalia. The United States pulled out in 1994, and the UN peacekeepers followed in 1995. Even after a 2002 reconciliation conference, Somalis had not secured a central government by 2004. The country remained impoverished, strife-ridden, and lawless. The UN and other non-governmental organizations, NGOs, worked to provide much-needed humanitarian relief to Somalis. Some military and foreign affairs experts point to the Battle of Mogadishu as a primary 
reason for American reluctance to engage troops in the world's hotspots in the 1990s. Who invented the computer? English mathematician Charles Babbage, 1792-1871, is recognized as the first to conceptualize the computer. He worked to develop a mechanical computing machine called the analytical engine, which is considered the prototype of the digital computer. While attending Cambridge University in 1812, Babbage conceived of the idea of a machine that could calculate data faster than could humans and without human error. These were the early years of the Industrial Revolution. And the world Babbage lived in was growing increasingly complex. Human errors in mathematical tables posed serious problems for many burgeoning industries. After graduating from Cambridge, Babbage returned to the idea of a computational aid. He spent the rest of his life and much of his fortune trying to build such a machine. But he was not to finish. Nevertheless, Babbage's never completed analytical engine, on which he began work in 1834, was the forerunner of the modern digital computer. A programmable electronic device that stores, retrieves, and processes data. Babbage's device used punch cards to store data and was intended to print answers. More than 100 years later, the first fully automatic calculator was invented. Development began in 1939 at Harvard University. Under the direction of mathematician Howard Aiken, 1900-1973, the first electronic digital computer, called Mark I, was invented in 1944. The Mark II followed in 1947. In 1946 scientists at the University of Pennsylvania completed NIAC. Electronic Numerical Integrator and Calculator, the first all-purpose electronic digital computer. Operating on 18,000 vacuum tubes, NIAC was large. Required great deal of power to run, and generated a lot of heat. The first computer to handle both numeric and alphabetical data with equal facility was the Univac. Universal Automatic Computer, developed between 1946 and 1951, also at the University of Pennsylvania. When was public broadcasting started? In the United States it was started in 1967, when the Public Broadcasting Act was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. 1908-1973, on November 7. Creating a corporation for public broadcasting to broaden the scope of non-commercial radio and TV beyond its educational role. Within three years, and as a result of federal grants, plus funds from foundations, business, and private contributions, public broadcasting service. PBS, rivaled the big three networks, NBC, CBS, and ABC, for viewers. In England the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC. 
took control of the development of television in 1932, launching BBC TV. The BBC had been founded as a radio broadcaster in 1922 under the leadership of English engineer John Charles Reith, 1889-1971. Reith remained at the helm of the BBC for 16 years after its founding and under his guidance. It became one of Britain's most revered institutions, supported by the public with licence fees. What was the lost colony? It was the second English colony established in America, set up in 1587 on Roanoke Island. Off the coast of North Carolina, by 1590 it had disappeared without a trace. Theories surround the disappearance, though it is not known for sure what happened. Roanoke Island had also been the site of the first English colony. Set up in 1585 by about 100 men who were sent there by Sir Walter Raleigh, 1554-1618. Raleigh had perceived the island to be a good spot for English warships that were then fighting the Spanish, to be repaired and loaded with new supplies. But the plan was not a success, the land wasn't fertile enough to support. Both the colonists and the Indians living nearby. And ships could not get close enough to the island since the surrounding sea proved too shallow. The colonists returned to England the following year. Meantime, Raleigh had dispatched another group of colonists from England. They arrived at Roanoke days after the original settlers left. Seeing that the site had been abandoned, all but 15 of the colonists opted to return to England. In spring 1587 Raleigh sent yet another group of colonists to America. But these ships were headed for areas near Chesapeake Bay, farther north, in present-day Virginia. Reaching the outer banks in July, the ship's commander refused to take the colonists to their destination and instead left them at Roanoke Island. The colonists' leader, John White, who had also been among the first settlers at Roanoke, returned to England for supplies in August 1587. However, the ongoing war between England and Spain prevented him from returning to the colony until three years later. Arriving back at Roanoke in August 1590, expecting to be met by family members and the 100 or so settlers, including some women and children, Instead he discovered that the colony was abandoned. The only clue that White found was the word Crotoan, which had been engraved on a tree. The Crotoan, or Hatteras, were friendly Indians who lived on an island south of Roanoke Island. White set out to see if the colonists had joined the Hatteras Indians but weather prevented the search and his expedition returned to England instead. Two theories explain what might have become of the lost colonists. Since the shore of Chesapeake Bay was their original destination, the colonists might have moved there but encountering resistance, perished at the hands of the Indians. Other evidence suggests that the colonists became integrated with several Indian tribes living in North Carolina. 
either way, they were never seen again by Europeans. Is Virgil's Aeneid an unfinished work? Yes, the Aeneid was technically unfinished by its author, Virgil, 70-19b. C, who is considered the greatest Roman poet. Virgil spent the last ten years of his life working on the Aeneid. And he planned to devote three more years making revisions to this epic when during his travels to gather new material for the poem, he became ill with fever and died. On his deathbed, Virgil requested that his companions burn the Aeneid. However, Augustus, 63b.ca.d14 The Emperor of Rome, countermanded the request, asking Virgil's friends to edit the manuscript. Augustus did specify that the writers not add, delete, or alter the text significantly. The Aeneid, Virgil's great epic about the role of Rome in world history, was first published in 17 BC. The work consists of 12 books, each between 700 and 1000 lines long. What was the dot-com bubble? The dot-com bubble was a phenomenon of the late 1990s. When there was unguarded optimism for internet-based businesses. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, a bubble has long been defined as anything fragile unsubstantial, empty, or worthless, since the 17th century. The word has been applied to delusive commercial or financial schemes. Dot-com refers to a commercial internet venture, which most often carries the com suffix in its URL, or internet address. The dot-com bubble inflated quickly. The graphical user interface, GUI, of the World Wide Web, with point-and-click hyperlinks, was integrated into the previously academic-oriented Internet in the early 1990s, making it more user-friendly for the average person. Public use of the Internet expanded rapidly. Existing businesses realized they needed a presence on the Internet for information or marketing purposes, if not for commerce. The promise of conducting business online, where costs were wrongly, judged to be low, spurred entrepreneurs. New businesses began popping up to take advantage of the commercial or e-commerce possibilities, of the net, these were the start UPS. They often had no real world, or bricks and mortar, correlation. They strived to make money by reaching consumers only over the internet. Among the start UPS of the dot-com bubble were Amazon, eBay, Edoise, WebMD, Hot Jobs, and Monster. Startups were known by several characteristics, because of investor optimism about e-commerce. Startups had quick access to venture capital funds, their managers were usually young, risk-taking gensers. Some of whom were unsalaried workers who signed on for the promise of big earnings through stock options. 
They spent lavishly on their office spaces and on employee perks, they conducted expensive advertising and marketing campaigns. And, when taken public on the stock market, in an IPO, or initial public offering. The original owners and investors were known to make huge amounts of money, at least on paper. Once the dot-coms were on the stock market, the technology-heavy Nasdaq was home to many. Individual investors became enchanted with them. Artificially inflating their stock prices, even when many companies had yet to earn a dime. The price-to-earnings ratio, or PE, a measure of performance used by investors. Became virtually meaningless when applied to the dot-coms. The height of the dot-com bubble was the, January, 2000 Super Bowl. When almost 20 dot-com companies paid more than $2 million each for prime advertising spots. On March 10, 2000, the Nasdaq index of leading technology peaked at 5,048.62. A year earlier the index was less than half that. Right around 2,500, and a year later it hovered around 2,000, or about 40% of its peak. In spring 2005 the Nasdaq Composite Index was below 2,000. Some called the March 2000 burst cataclysmic, but other analysts and investors saw the end of the dot-com bubble as a necessary correction. Or thinning, after which earnest players could get. On with building internet-based businesses that would be successful in the long run. Whatever the view, the dot-com bubble was the biggest market bubble ever seen, and many investors lost big. What does Jungian mean? Jungian refers to the analytical psychology founded by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Gustav Jung, 1875-1961. Early in his career Jung conducted experiments in mental association and through this work came into contact with famed psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud, 1856-1939, in 1907, while initially in harmony with each other. Jung later broke with Freud's theories, establishing his own doctrines of human behavior. Like Freud, Jung believed that the unconscious, that part of the mind of which a person is unaware, affects human behavior. But unlike his Austrian colleague, Jung denied that neuroses have any sexual basis. Instead, Jung believed that many factors influence human behavior, including the personalities of one's parents. He also believed in something he described as the collective unconscious. In his revolutionary work Psychology of the Unconscious, published in 1912, Jung asserted that there are two dimensions of the unconscious, the personal and the collective. The collective unconscious, according to Jung, is made up of those acts and mental patterns that are shared by members of a culture or are perhaps universally shared by all humankind. He theorized that the collective unconscious manifests itself in archetypes images, patterns, and symbols that appear in dreams and fantasies as well as in mythology, religion, and literature. Jung believed that the collective unconsciousness can serve as a guide to humanity and 
Therefore, he taught that therapy should make people aware of it. Jung's Theories of Archetypes, or Universal Symbols have influenced such diverse fields as anthropology, art, filmmaking, and history. Jung later developed a system for classifying personalities, into introverted and extroverted types. And distinguishing among mental functions, classifying them as thinking, feeling, sensing, or intuitive. Jung taught that therapists should help their patients balance introversion. Relying only on oneself for personal fulfillment, with extroversion, relying on others for personal fulfillment. Jung's system of classifications, or typology, has been used to develop theories of personality types and their influences on human behavior.